morning. I'm Roger Wadeen, Director of Policy and Education with the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce, and I'm joined on stage this morning with Chuck Frederick, who's the editorial page editor for the Duluth News Tribune, our sponsor of the forum, and our partner in today's discussion. Of course, we'd also like to welcome U.S. Representative Chip Kravak and former U.S. Representative Rick Nolan. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us this morning, taking time out of your busy campaign schedule to uh, join us. We hope to have a thoughtful discussion on the issues this morning, and in the interest of fairness to each of our guests, we'll ask that opening and closing statements be kept to three minutes, and answers to questions be limited to two minutes with the possible follow-up. And Tina down here in the front row will hold up signs to uh, remind us uh, of the time. And as David indicated, we're pleased to have representatives from the Duluth Superior Community Foundation Civility Project assist us this morning. The materials you received as you entered is a listing of our expectations of you as the audience, and the flip side has several questions that we would appreciate you complete, and they'll be collected upon your leaving today. We intend on having a civil discussion this morning. We will not tolerate any disruptive behavior. If there is, we'll ask one of the officers stationed in the auditorium to escort you out. Chuck and I will moderate. There will be no questions from the audience. Please hold your applause until the conclusion of this morning's discussion. Chuck, why don't you start us off? Well, thank you very much, Roger, and thanks to everyone who's here, everyone who's watching online and watching on television. In addition to, uh, to, to being a great opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, this forum is part of the Duluth News Tribune's endorsement process. Uh, endorsements, I think, might come out as soon as this weekend, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, with regard to uh, opening and closing statements uh, and, and the question of who gets to go first and who gets the last word, Roger and I flipped a coin backstage before, actually it was right over here, side stage, uh, before, before we started and Representative Kravac uh, won that flip and he has chosen to have the last word. So uh, with an opening statement, uh, I throw it to uh, Representative Nolan. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I want to thank the uh, Duluth Chamber, Duluth News Tribune, and of course Congressman Chip Kravac for being here this morning, and, uh, and of course the audience giving us a chance to debate the great and important issues that we're facing in this election contest. Uh, I also would like to take a, a brief moment to introduce my number one uh, political advisor and uh, my best friend, my hunting and fishing partner, and my uh, uh, someone who shares my passion for, for public service, my wife, Mary Nolan. Mary, would you just stand up for a second? <clears throat> uh, as as, as um, for myself, I'm a fourth generation um, Iron Ranger. Um, I've uh, raised my family. I've uh, built my business here in Minnesota's 8th Congressional District. And I know that, that that's no requirement for representation, but I, I will tell you, it gives one a great advantage. Um, I, uh, I know firsthand what people want and what they expect uh, out of a congressman from our district because they, uh, they're the same things that I want, the same things that I expect for my family, uh, my friends, and, and for my neighbors. This election contest uh, offers us a real clear choice, much, much more so, I think, than in most election contests. Uh, Congressman uh, Kravak has voted repeatedly to um, end Medicare, um, as we know it, increasing costs uh, for our elderly. Uh, Congressman Kravak has uh, voted uh, numerous times to increase military spending while uh, cutting uh, domestic spending for our infrastructure, our education, and our human development uh, initiatives. Congressman Kravak has voted repeatedly to provide more tax cuts for the super rich in this country and additionally uh, provide tax cuts for uh, the big multinationals to uh, outsource and move their manufacturing uh, overseas. <clears throat> I'm running for public office because I think there's a better way. I think we have to put an end to the endless wars of choice and the war in Afghanistan and the uh, nation building abroad. That's money, that's trillions of dollars of money and savings that we can use to balance our budgets and to uh, rebuild America, our roads, our bridges, our schools, our hospitals, uh, provide money for education, provide money for human development. I believe that we need to protect Medicare. Uh, that's Medicare, Social Security. Those are not uh, entitlements. Those are earned benefits that people uh, started paying for the very first day that they went to work. 
They're entitled to those benefits. Uh, they've earned them, and we have to do everything we can to make sure that we protect them. We have to keep our promise to our seniors, and that, in large part, among other things, is what this election contest is really all about. I look forward to debating these issues and getting into the details, and uh, uh, look forward to, to this debate very much. Thank you, Congressman, and, and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Representative <laughs> Nolan. You've actually hit on most of the subjects we're going to be talking about, so. Well, good. Uh, Representative Kravak. Well, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate being here today. Thank you for all of you for sharing your morning here. And uh, also, thank you very much for the uh, Duluth Chamber for uh, hosting us here today. You know, while serving in the 8th District as your representative, I took the same principles I used as a naval officer to Congress. Protect the country. Preserve the Constitution. Uh, when I first started running, I was a stay-at-home dad that was a part of the PTO that was concerned for our children's futures. Today, I'm that same guy. I am very concerned about what's happening in Washington. Because when I went there, I knew it was broken. But I didn't realize how broken it was till I actually got there. We've had the highest and longest unemployment since the Great Depression. We've had an unprecedented four straight years of trillion-dollar deficits. We are $16 trillion in debt. And for the first time in history, the credit rating of the United States has been downgraded. And starting January 2nd, we're going to start dismantling our military with, with the biggest budget cut, one of the biggest budget cuts in history, actually, and therefore jeopardizing the national security of this great nation. That concerns me as an American. In the last two years, we've been able to do 29 town halls, introduce some new technology, 17 tele-town halls, a new model and concept of 300 mobile offices throughout the 8th District. Our motto was, if you can't come to us, we're coming to you. In these fiscally tough times, our office was the only office of the U.S. House of Representatives in Minnesota that gave $90,000 back to the U.S. Treasury after giving us an initial 5% cut and then an additional 6% cut after that. I'm proud to say that I've only missed less than 1% of the votes in Washington. In the last two years, we've been able to have bipartisan, pro-growth, pro-economic type of legislation that speaks for itself. I believe that government overregulation is absolutely crushing our small businesses and our industry, thereby jeopardizing Minnesota's livelihood for their families and the Minnesota worker. Right now in Duluth, we had a little bit of a curveball thrown at us this year with a 500-year flood. I'd like to congratulate uh, Mayor Ness, our senators, and all our first responders for the great work that they did in getting us back up and running again. There's been a lot of damage to private property and public infrastructure, but at the end of the day, we came together as Minnesotans, brought it together, and took care of our neighbors. As for my opponent, I'd like to thank uh, Congressman Nolan for being here today. I appreciate him joining us, and I look forward to a productive discussion on the issues. While I know that both of us truly want what's best for the 8th District and what's best for the nation, we have a very divergent way of how to get there. I believe that more government and more regulations is not the answer. As a matter of fact, I think it's the question, or the problem. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time today. I look forward to a open and honest debate on the issues. Well, thanks to both of you. I think I'm going to ask the first question here. Let's get right to the, the, the issue that the word that keeps coming up in letters to the editor and <laughs> all the nasty uh, TV commercials. That's Medicare. Uh, and it, it seems, if you believe the attack ads, that both of you want to do away with Medicare or have tried to do away with Medicare and, and the heck with Granny and Grandpa. And So I'd like to, for both of you to just please describe what you see as the future of Medicare and what the future needs to be and why and how your approach differs from what you perceive your opponent's approach might be. And we'll, we'll give you two minutes on, on answers to questions, and uh, Congressman Kravak, we'll start with you. First off, I believe that Medicare is a commitment. It's a commitment we made to our seniors. It's a commitment that I made to my 81-year-old dad that I'd make sure that Medicare was going to be there for them. <clears throat> we have a plan. I'd be more than happy to take a look at another plan, but unfortunately there isn't one. The bottom line is Medicare is insolvent in 2022. Doing nothing is an actually a dereliction of duty. So we have a bipartisan uh, House plan that addresses this issue. And 
It actually is a plan that came out of the Genesis out of the Clinton administration under Alice Rivlin, who actually worked in the Clinton administration. This is a Democrat plan. She worked with Paul Ryan together to save Medicare. And again, if you're 55 years and older, nothing changes for you. But if you're 54 years and younger, there has to be a change because there will be nothing in 2022. It gives future seniors options, the same type of options that federal employees get. So our plan, the bipartisan house plan, is a plan that gives our seniors options uh, through a premium support model. There are no vouchers. It is a premium support model. It is seam seamless to our seniors. And it, the second, at least of the, of the private plans, are going to be full premium support level. Or if you do not want to go with a private plan, you can go with traditional Medicare. The bottom line, it's patient-centered. It's patient-centered to give our seniors options. The other thing you have to discuss is the IPAB, the Independent Payment, and Pro uh, Pricing, uh, Payment Advisory Board. This board is an unelected, unaccountable board that will be making uh, medical decisions for our seniors. I think that's wrong way to go. I think those decisions should be made between the doctor and the patient. Thank you very much. Representative Nolan, I believe I've heard you say that you do support a plan. Can you please tell us about it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Medicare is a promise that we've made uh, to our seniors. And uh, it's, it's, it's a sacred promise in, in my judgment. We didn't get from a country with an average life expectancy of 47 to one of 77 without having provided some very good health care for our senior citizens. And up until that time, they were dependent upon the private sector, and it simply wasn't affordable. So we put together a good plan. We said to people, you know, we want you to start paying for your health care when you get older the very first day you go to work in your youth. And so um, I, I really reject the notion that Social Security and Medicare are, are some kind of entitlements. Those are earned benefits that people earned and paid for the very first day that they ever went to work, and they have every right to expect it. Now, we've all seen these attack ads against me. In fact, I'm told that uh, they're more being spent on those than any other candidate in the country. But I remind you that uh, no less than uh, WCCO, the Star Tribune, uh, NPR, uh, KSTP, uh, WCCO, they've all done their fact checks on these ads, and they've said that they're misleading, they're false, uh, they're untrue, that they are ridiculous. The fact is the Democrats have always supported Medicare. We will always support Medicare. And Congressman, with all due respect, um, um, you voted to uh, essentially end Medicare as we know it. That's the way the Wall Street Journal's described it. That's the way the New York Times have described it. That's the way all the fact checkers ha have described it. And, uh, and, that, and that's the way it is. I mean, you can, we can spin this all we want. But at the end of the day, the, the record is uh, what the record is. And I am as strong a supporter of Medicare and Social Security as is the Democratic Party, as, as you will ever find. And uh, your voting record shows that you voted to do away with Medicare, as we know it. Turn uh, seniors back over to the private insurance sector. And additionally, of course, you've supported privatization of Social Security. Re Representative and, Nolan, what, what about the future, though? What about going forward? And, Re and Representative Kravak, I'll, I'll give you some, some time to rebut, but I just want to follow up. What about this notion that Medicare will be insolvent in, in 2022? What, should we start preparing now? What's, what is your plan for the future? Well, ab ab absolutely. You know, we're looking at two things. Right now, we're looking at massive uh, deficits in our budget that are not sustainable, and they threaten our future. And it isn't Social Security and Medicare that caused that. Um, that's spending on uh, a number of issues that hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get into here. But yes, of course we have to make sure that Medicare and Social Security are viable. In so the so how? What, what is well, your plan? Um, you know, a recent study by the National Science Foundation showed there's as much as $750 billion a year in waste in our health care system. And um, so we have to attack that. We have to eliminate the fraud. We have to make sure that there aren't overpayments. We have to make sure that uh, the, the system is viable and do what it takes to make it viable. But we don't do that by, uh, as our congressman has suggested, by doing away with Medicare and, and replacing it with some voucher system 
or um, what essentially uh, turn it over to the insurance industry. Of course, but you know the point is we've got some time to work on that and we do have to work on that. And there's plenty of opportunities for savings without cutting benefits to our seniors. Thank you very much. Representative Kravac, 30 seconds to, to rebut that. Again, in the PolitiFact lie of the year of 2011 was that Republicans want to end Medicare. We have a plan. I'd love to look at a, the president's plan, but he doesn't have one. And the president's budget, which not one senator voted for or not, not one person in the House of Representatives voted for, doesn't even address the issue that Medicare trustees tell us that Medicare is bankrupt in 2022. We have a plan for maintaining the... Uh, Current seniors, make sure that they're taken care of 55 years and older. Nothing changes for you, but we have a plan for the future for the next generation of Americans to make sure something is there for them. Chuck, just a 10-second rebuttal. Yeah, you have a plan for Medicare. It's to do away with it. All right, you thank you, gentlemen. Put it back live the year of 2011. Thank you both. Let's uh, move on to another subject, and that's on the Affordable Care Act, or commonly known as Obamacare. Governor Romney has said that if he's elected president, he'll do away with it. Uh, I doubt he'd be able to do that unilaterally, but clearly through presidential directives, he could probably uh, do some uh, uh, changing of it. Um, it's upheld by the Supreme Court, remains the law of the land. Um, but is there something in Obamacare that's worth keeping? Do we have to throw the whole thing out? Uh, what's your opinion on that? Congressman Olin, let's start with you. Well, um, the Affordable Care Act is a, is, a, is a good beginning in providing a universal health care for our people um, in this country. And there are many uh, good features uh, that are in it. Uh, some are more apparent than others. Um, some of the obvious ones are uh, guaranteeing that uh, people can't be rejected because of a, a pre-existing condition. Uh, another one of the provisions uh, provides that... Um, uh, people can insure their children up to the age of, of 26. Uh, those are very helpful. There's some uh, really strong administrative uh, procedures that the insurance industry has indicated may save up to a trillion dollars uh, over the next 10 years by uh, streamlining the uh, application uh, process for reimbursement uh, for funds. And, uh, but it, it, it's only a, a good beginning. Um, we need in this country, a, uh, in my judgment, a universal single-payer national health care plan. The other developed countries of the world that have done this have found that uh, they provide exceptionally good quality care, and they do it for about half the cost, and, uh, uh, and they provide great care. If you look at the results, um, in many cases they have a higher life expectancy, they have lower infant mortality rate. There's just no excuse for not uh, ensuring that everybody in America has access to health care. And that's my ultimate goal. We'll take a look at the Affordable Care Act and uh, as it becomes implemented, see what's working, see what's not working, uh, make changes along the way. I've never seen a, a law or a, a new program like that that didn't need some adjustments along the way. And so that's what we'll do. But the goal has to be to make sure that everyone in America has access to affordable health care. Thank you, Congressman Cravat. First off, in addressing Obamacare, the first thing that you have to take a look at is to zoom up to the 35,000 foot level and take a look that not one member of Congress read the bill. Let's just start there. And after, the, uh, after the, we actually started reading the bill and the bureaucrats started going through it, they're only halfway through it right now. Uh, they've created another 30,000 30, pages of additional rules and regulations. We've already seen like the 1099 program that was actually gonna kill our small businesses. We we're able to repeal that. The Class Act, which we were able to repeal that, even uh, uh, Sebelius came out and said that it was completely unsustainable. Uh, we're having one of the biggest tax increases on Americans because of Obamacare. And again, we have to go to the IPAB, the Independent P Payment Advisory Board, which is an unelected, unaccountable board. Right now, our, our seniors can come to me when they're having problems with their Medicare, and I can address the issues that they may have regarding Medicare. Now, in the future, because of an unaccountable, unelected board, I can't. I will not be able to help if you're having problems with Medicare because of an unelected, unaccountable uh, board that I'll be using pricing to... Uh, to uh, tell doctors how much they can charge, what, what types of procedures that they can do. 
And now, that is doctors tell us, doctors come out and tell us, they say, you may have health care, uh, insurance, but you may not have health care. If a senior goes into a doctor and, and says, I need a uh, hip replacement or something of that nature, the doctor says, well, I charge as much, but Medicare is not going to cover it. You can't even say that you'll pay for it with your own money to make up the difference. And all you got to do is take a look at our Canadian friends. Where do they come for health care in a single-payer system? They come to the United States for health care. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about your, your political approaches and what you perceive your, your opponent's political approaches and records uh, to be with regard to helping the middle class, uh, the everyday folks like most of us here in Duluth. Uh, I'm talking about things like taxes, tax breaks, tax credits. Uh, I'm not talking about sweetheart deals for millionaire friends, as I oft hear some congressmen accused of making, but feel free to address that. Uh, <laughs> again, two minutes, and Representative Nolan, you can go first. Well, um, first of all, I spent the last uh, 30 years of my life in business, and uh, I tell you, I've learned a few things along the way. Um, I've had my, uh, I felt the pain of defeat, um, and I've uh, enjoyed the, uh, uh, the joy of success in business. But I tell you what, you learn a lot of things um, along the way. And I might, I don't mind telling, I've become uh, quite fiscally conservative. Uh, you learn in business uh, about balancing budgets, about meeting payrolls, about uh, getting things done, and you learn that you have to cut spending where you're not getting a return on your dollar, and you learn that you have to be, uh, not be afraid to spend some money where you are going to get a, a return on your dollar. And uh, hopefully we get into these issues about our spending priorities and uh, the difference between Congressman Kravak uh, and myself. But I tell you, one of the great problems in this country is the decline on the middle class. The rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is getting crushed. And I don't mind telling you, as a businessman, you can give me tax breaks, you know, all you want from now till kingdom come and I'll say thank you, <laughs> you know, and none of us are excited about having to pay taxes. But I tell you, there's only one thing that stimulates a real honest to goodness business owner uh, to invest in new equipment and to hire new personnel and to build new facilities. And that's a demand for your product. And demand for your product comes from a middle class. And the growing inequalities between the rich and the poor and the destruction of the middle class is one of the, the, the most terrible things that is happening to this economy today. And whether it comes to taxes or spending, helping a, a, a poor kid get a chance to go to college, whether uh, standing up and defending collective bargaining rights and wages and benefits for the working people, every opportunity that we get Yet, we have to say to ourselves, is this good for the middle class? Because we're going to build this economy back up from the middle out, not from the top down. That doesn't work. That's what got us into trouble. The middle class, that's what this election contest is all about. Excellent. Thank you very much. Congressman Kravak on helping the middle class. It's about jobs. It's about creating jobs. It's about getting the small business owner to give them the confidence to be able to expand and create jobs. I've been endorsed by the NFIB, and listening to small business owners and listening what they tell me, there are two things that prevent job creation in this country, and that's an overbearing tax code and also uh, the amount of rules and regulations that are placed on small businesses. The bipartisan house plan, they give everyone a tax break, but at the same time, they are eliminating the special carve-outs the loopholes that only a small percentage of taxpayers actually get. We need to incentivize the small business owner, ensure that they can expand and create the jobs that are needed for the middle class. Seven out of ten people are employed by small businesses throughout the nation. I would say that's actually higher in the 8th District of Minnesota because we are small businesses. We are small towns. So when you incentivize the small business owner, so they give the confidence to expand and create jobs, that is the key to creating jobs, and therefore, when you create those jobs, you create the demand that Congressman Nolan was talking about. You can't create demand artificially from the government. You have to create demand from the people, and you do that by two things. You give them uh, a tax code that they can work with and eliminating the rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations, every time there's a new rule, 
a new regulation, that's more money to that uh, small business owner that takes us out of their back pocket that they can make sure they invest in their company. I think it's time that we get the small business owner to pay more attention to their customers and less time to the IRS. Thank you both. Um, <clears throat> well, I, 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 neither, neither of you touched sweetheart deals for millionaires. I'm a little, little disappointed. But uh, <laughs> Representative Nolan, I'd like to give you 30 seconds to rebut if you'd like. Well, I was just going to say, you know, if you look at the studies by the National Federation of Small Businesses, they will tell you it's not tax breaks that stimulate uh, them to invest. It's a demand for your product. So you know, we got this thing upside down, you know. Um, God, you voted repeatedly. Uh, to give more and more tax breaks to the richest and most powerful people uh, in this country under the guise that we're helping small business. I am a small businessman, um, I, and I'm in a, a difficult business, a, a difficult industry in the forest industry products. We don't have a problem with regulations, for crying out loud. Uh, we want to have healthy, safe working conditions for our workers. I, we don't want to pollute our neighborhood and, and our environment, um, but we do need demand for our product. Give me a tax break. Why would I invest in new equipment, no, new personnel, uh, new buildings to have it sit there idle? Uh, what I need is another order for a load of pallets every day. And then if I get that, I'll put people to work. And to get that, I need demand for my product. Very good. Thank you. Roger? Go ahead, Congressman Quebec. And, and get demand for your product. You have to get people back to work. The people create the demand. Exactly. And making sure that the small business owner can expand and create those jobs that create the demand. Again, the, the NFIB, yeah. which was in, uh, the, that endorsed me, yeah. is saying it's the key to the recovery is the small business owner creating jobs throughout the United States. It cannot be artificially, uh, the, it, we cannot create artificial demand from the government. You have said that regulations actually create jobs. You said that the EPA actually creates jobs. Well, maybe they do in Washington, but they sure don't create jobs back home. Well, you know what, if you look at the statistics, you're just, you're just wrong on that point. Um, the environmental industry created more jobs in this country than any other sector of the industry. Just a few years ago, acid rain was destroying our forests and our lakes here. And regulations came in and said, you can't do that. And guess what? The coal-fired power plants had to build scrubbers to put on their plants to scrub the sulfur out of the sulfuric emissions. The automobile industry had to put on a, what ultimately became the catalytic converter to scrub the uh, sulfuric emissions uh, out of, the, of their exhaust. Someone had to build the catalytic converter. Someone had to build the scrubbers. Someone had to install them. Someone had to maintain them. It's a classic example of how a regulation ended up saving our forest and our lakes, which were uh, being destroyed at the time, and uh, we did it in a way that actually, at the end of the day, uh, created a lot of good jobs. And if you look at the stats, in the 70s and the 80s, more good jobs were created in this country in the environmental industry than any other sector of the industry. But to your other point, and your important point, you can't artificially uh, create a demand and you sure can't create it by providing tax breaks for small businesses when they don't have demand for their product. You got the cart ahead of the horse. You got to build the middle class. You got to build good paying jobs. That creates demand. And then the small business owner will invest and hire new people and expand their production. Congressman Quebec, uh, just a few moments, please, sure. to respond. Yeah. Again, you cannot artificially create demand from the government. You're going to create demand from the middle sector by providing jobs. Jobs are the key to the success of the recovery, and that's going to come from the small business owner that employs seven out of ten people in this country. I couldn't agree more with you. If you're not going to do a tax breaks, you're, you're, tax breaks, you're going to do it by creating demand for their product. That's right. how you get jobs. Let's move create on. Demand through the private <laughs> sector. <laughs> Let's move on. There's uh, certainly no one in this room that doesn't uh, understand how important the iron mining industry is to Minnesota and thereby to the rest of the country. And now we're encouraged by uh, the fact that Polymet and Twin Metals and others are considering uh, significant investments in non-ferrous mining. Uh, Polymet is tens of millions of dollars and years into their permitting process. Uh, Twin Metals is not too far behind. What can we be doing in terms of permitting and regulations that encourage uh, this non-ferrous mining industry? Congressman Kravak, let's uh, start with you. Well, we actually were proactive in having four quarterly meetings so far with PolyMet and with all the, all the principal parties within uh, the PolyMet, the agencies, uh, Native American tribes. We all got, we, uh, got down, we talked, 
It was a very productive meeting. Uh, even uh, Representative Rukavina said it was extremely productive in moving the PolyMet project forward. Uh, one of the chief things that we found out, a lot of the agencies were talking to one another. And we found to be that one of the uh, major problems with the uh, getting PolyMet rolling. Uh, I've got good news for PolyMet. I'm po just talking with them last week. Uh, they are done with all, all their studies. Now it's a paperwork drill. Uh, it'll be going through the bureaucracy right now. We actually created legislation, a 30-month streamlining plan that will uh, have projects like PolyMet and a Twin Metals project to make sure we get rid of duplicative uh, studies that are being done. It, it's quite evident that a lot of, we have uh, federal agencies doing the same thing as state agencies. You know, why, why duplicate studies uh, when the state agencies actually, for a lot of instances, have higher uh, standards than, than the federal agency? Getting the permitting process is key. To get these jobs, 300, 350 full-time jobs with PolyMet, 2,000 to 2,500 jobs up at the Twin Metals Project. And at UMD did an excellent study that showed for every one mining job in the 8th District of Minnesota is 2.5 ancillary jobs on top of that. Talk about creating demand. Uh, I see a future at the 8th District of Minnesota where people are moving here for jobs. Uh, Twin Metals, for example, is very concerned. We do not have enough men and women in the trades to be able to meet the demands of the, these future mining projects. I'm very concerned about that. That's why I go out and I talk to high schools about young high schoolers getting into the trades to meet that demand. Congressman Nolan, your thoughts on our permitting and regulatory process? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a fourth generation Iron Ranger. I've always been for mining. I always will be for mining most of my uh, People in my neighborhood have worked at the mines at one time or another, and we have a, a new uh, manganese mining operation that's uh, getting underway, getting started just north of where our family sawmill and pallet factory uh, is located. Uh, this might be one area, uh, Congressman, where you and I have some agreement. We clearly do have to uh, find some ways to expedite uh, this permitting process. I was delighted to see here yesterday where the governor has put together a meeting with the mining company executives and the uh, the uh, mine workers and the unions, and it looks like they have a, uh, a process now uh, where they hope to uh, be able to wrap up the, the permit process for uh, PolyMet uh, sometime here uh, late winter or, or early spring. It's long overdue. It's taken eight years, $42 million, and uh, that, 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 that's simply uh, inexcusable. But I tell you, I've met with the mining companies. I've, of course, met with the steel workers, and I'm so proud to have the uh, miners and the steel workers workers uh, endorsing my campaign and uh, I haven't found any of them yet that have any uh, serious problems with with the regulations including the companies we, we don't have any problem but we want the process to be expedited and I tell you sometimes you don't just do that by introducing a bill I was up at Bluefin Bay last night and they reminded me of how I went to bat for them when the DNR wouldn't approve that project and if some of you get up there, they got oatmeal Nolan on the menu in, in, in recognition of that because um, <clears throat> I wouldn't take any pay for the deal. I ran into the mayor of uh, Elbertville, uh, Cornelius Paulson, the other day. He says, Nolan, I'll never forget the time you went. We couldn't get our, our sewer projects approved, and you went with us to the Chicago EPA offices, and, and you went to the Washington EPA offices, and you banged heads together, and, and you make sure the, the job got done. And he said, as a result, of it, we got our projects approved. We went from a sleepy little town of 700 to a, a thriving metropolis of 7,000 with jobs all over the place. Thank you, Congressman Nolan, he said. So sometimes you just got to roll up your sleeves and uh, get everybody together in the room and say, we're locking the doors and nobody's going home till we, till we figure this thing out and get a solution. That's the kind of thing I really like to do. <laughs> well, I like rolling up my sleeves too uh, with the Buy American Steel Amendment. Uh, with the Buy American Steel Amendment, we're making sure that, that American Steel goes on American projects. And I had to go head-to-head, -head, actually, with a fellow Republican in committee who tried to <clears throat> gut that, that uh, bill to make sure that we use American Steel on American projects. Uh, to me, what a concept. Uh, I, I've been able to uh, receive the endorsement uh, from uh, Mayor Roger Scraba up, up in Ely and uh, Mike Forsman, who's the county commissioner up St. Louis County, uh, because they know how strong I am on pro-mining issues. Now, even Jeff Anderson, who now works for you, uh, has come out and said that Cravac gets it. 
He's the, he's the pro-mining candidate in this race. And, uh, you know, I'm a strong proponent of mining, both taconite mining, because we cannot forget taconite, and also the polymet mining as well. We have God's grace. We have the second to third richest precious metal find here in the, in the 8th District of Minnesota. And we are very blessed, and I think we should be able to harvest in an environmentally friendly way. Thank you. Um, quick rebuttal. All I would say, if you, if you want Ten to seconds. Line, if you want to line up endorsements on the Iron Range, I got a heck of a lot more than you do, starting with the steel workers and the retired steel workers. But we got jobs coming to the Iron Range, and that's what I'm working on. Yep. Thank, thank you so both I, very much. You're both doing a little bit better than our presidential candidates on, on watching the, <laughs> the time. But uh, let's, let's keep an eye on Tina down here and her sign. Uh, let, let's switch, uh, switch gears here and talk a little bit about transportation. Congressman Kravak, shortly after you were elected in 2010, you questioned the new terminal project up at the Duluth International Airport. I think you, you came to change your mind on that one. But you brought up the issue of wants versus needs. And, and, and I think that that's a very critical issue when it comes to transportation funding, uh, things like highways and airports and passenger rail lines and vehicle miles, travel taxes, and, and things like that. I, I'm curious what, what you consider wants and needs uh, with, with, with regard to, to transportation funding and, and how you would prioritize transportation funding from each of you, of course. And Congressman Kravak, we'll start with you. Uh, two minutes, please. Well, obviously, uh, being on transportation infrastructure, this is what I've been working on for the last two years, ensuring that uh, we have the right money going to the right projects uh, for the right reasons. And uh, I work very closely with Brian Mix on the airport expansion. It's, uh, it has gone well. I'm on aviation. I'm the uh, vice chair of aviation. We worked uh, very hard, and, and I just was up at the airport last week with uh, with the uh, transportation chairman, John Micah. Uh, we were able to talk and take a look, and the plan's going well. I'm very proud of that. Uh, we were able to pass a transportation bill, which has had nine extensions uh, in the previous Congress, in the 111th Congress, with a Democratic House, Democratic uh, Senate, and a Democratic President, wasn't able to get passed. And we were able to pass it in the 112th Congress. Um, we wanted to make sure that the right dollars went to the right projects. We want to make sure that the gas tax is used wisely. Uh, within the transportation bill, I was able to insert the Buy American Steel Amendment to make sure that uh, American Steel, by the way, which 80 percent comes from the range, goes on American projects. And in addition to that, I was able to beat back the VMT, the vi uh, Vehicle Mileage Tax, which was tried to be brought up. That would actually kill uh, us in rural districts with that vehicle mileage tax. Now, you know, the pro in the bipartisan uh, House agreement, what we believe is that we can make sure that by having drilling royalties associated uh, with our transportation, so to make sure, I'm watching you, Tina, um, <laughs> making sure that we can uh, fund the projects that we need, making sure, the, uh, making sure our, our, uh, our gas tax gets to the infrastructure that we need, make sure it gets to what it's paid for, goes to our bridges and our roads, and getting our people back to work. We were able to pass it. I wanted a five-year bill, but we passed a two-year bill. But to give our contractors the stability to make sure they can recapitalize, hire, and invest. Thank you. Congressman Olin. Um, you know, Congressman, uh, the old uh, football coach, Bill Purcell, once said that um, uh, you can spend the game any way you want, but at the end of the day, your record is your record. And, um, you know, when it comes to uh, transportation, you know, uh, and your votes, I, I, of course, saw where you, you voted to increase nation building abroad and the military by some $4 trillion. Uh, but you voted also to uh, cut uh, trans transportation funding and infrastructure funding here. In fact, I believe the bill that, uh, that you ultimately did pass, you're talking about cut transportation funding by uh, almost a third. Um, you spoke out against the uh, airport terminal here in Duluth. Uh, you introduced legislation and voted to do away with essential air services for regional airports like Brainerd and Hibbing and uh, International Falls and, and Bemidji. Uh, you spoke out against the uh, Intermodal Transportation Center here for Duluth, and you've come out against the, the rail passenger service uh, between here and the Twin Cities and the Northern Express, which would uh, go along the western uh, end, end uh, of this district. Uh, time and time and again, um, you just didn't seem to understand the importance of transportation for economic development and, and for creating jobs. In fact, I reminded you, you spoke out against the uh, uh, acquisition uh, of uh, Cirrus, which uh, kept that uh, company in business, uh, maintaining, creating um, hundreds of jobs. Um, the fact is, is that our 
transportation uh, system, whether it be air, rail, uh, highways, is such an integral part of the foundation um, that's essential uh, for job creation and building uh, quality communities. And I've just been, uh, like a lot of people, decided, very, very disappointed to see you coming out against and uh, speaking against and voting against the funding for so many of these essential transportation services and programs. Again, as a member of the Transportation Committee, one of the things you have to t weigh and balance is where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Uh, the, the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission uh, said that in 2025, so Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and the interest we pay on our debt is going to take 100% of our revenue. So every dollar in addition to that has to be borrowed from someone. The majority of it is coming from China. So we were very fiscally responsible. And regarding EAS, I was the working chair. We were able to reach a bipartisan decision on that. In regards for Cirrus, as you know, Congressman, I'm on counterterrorism intelligence. And the Williams engine in the Cirrus aircraft also works in our Tomahawk cruise missiles. And I was very concerned about the transfer of technology in that aspect. Very good. Thank you both. A um, little, little, little quick ahead. rebuttal. Um, the, the National Security uh, uh, Council, of course, reviewed the, the whole Cirrus thing, and, and they, they saw it, that in no way did it jeopardize um, our national security. It went past. No, they, they approved it. And then, and then secondly, um, um, you know, when it, when it, when it comes to uh, where the money comes from, it's a question. I mean, you, you continually devote trillions and trillions of dollars for these endless wars of choice in this nation building abroad. It's not a question of where the, whether or not there's money. It's a question of where the money goes. And uh, you've been a real big spender when it comes to national building abroad, but you're not much of a spender when it comes to building our own communities and creating jobs here where people need good jobs and need good transportation. I'm sorry. In rebuttal, Final in, word, in, in rebuttal to that, in regards to the nation, but we are spending 3.65% of our GDP, which is the lowest it's been in, uh, since 1948 for our nation building and wars of choice, if you call it. The wars of choice, you call it, sir, are in response to 9-11, where over 3,000 Americans were killed. <clears throat> now, I believe in protecting the United States. We didn't look for this fight. It came to our shores. And that's a response to 9-11 and Americans being killed. Well, um, I, I know a little bit about uh, the world as well, having been an export trader, and I've actually lived in the Middle East and studied the language and studied the culture. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but it wasn't Iraq that attacked uh, the United States. Um, <laughs> It was uh, um, Al Qaeda, and uh, we, uh, we 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 crushed them in in Afghanistan as we should, and nobody believes um, more strongly than I do in a good national strong national defense. But that doesn't mean we have to keep doing this nation building where it's not wanted, where it's not welcome, where they blow it up faster than we can build it. And it doesn't mean we have to have a military base in every nook and cranny of the earth. It doesn't mean we have to be the policemen of the world. Every nation that's ever tried to do that has ended up collapsing uh, of bankruptcy in its own dead weight. Final word, Congressman Kravak, and then we must move on. In regards to our nation, we're planning to take $1 trillion out of our, our national defense. We're going to have the smallest Navy since 1915. We will have the smallest ground forces since 1940 and the smallest Air Force in existence of its history. I believe that is a detriment to the national defense of this country and leaves us vulnerable. Well, just real quickly, the smallest... Uh, Rod, let's, let's move on to the next issue, well, please. No, no, this is an important point. The, the smallest, in your judgment, is bigger and more than all of the rest of the world combined. Well, now I do feel like Jim Lair. Roger? <laughs> let, let, let's move on and let's broaden this discussion out a little bit. Uh, a Gallup poll that was released in August finds just one in ten Americans approve of the job that Congress is doing. Uh, CBS New York Times survey in July found just 12 percent. National Public Radio conducted a poll and they found uh, 17 percent. Whether it's 10 or 12 or 17 percent, it's low. Yeah. And when people talk about the political discourse in Washington, D.C., uh, sure, they might be affected by the economy that we've been going through, but clearly a big part of it is the bitter, bipartisan, or bitter partisan discussions that take place on virtually any issue. Uh, how, what can we do to soften this political discourse that seems to be not only disruptive, uh, but simply doesn't allow things to get done. Congressman Nolan, your thoughts on the partisan nature of politics these days? 
Well, it, it, certainly it's very, very disturbing. Um, and I know, uh, Congressman, my, my first uh, uh, term of service in the Congress of the United States, we worked 48 out of uh, 52 weeks in the year, and I, I see you guys have worked about uh, 32 weeks out of, out of the 52. Um, the Congress now goes into session uh, generally at 6 o'clock on a Tuesday night, and you have some votes scheduled, and what you don't finish up on Tuesday night, you finish up on Wednesday morning, and then after two or three rigorous weeks like that, while well, you go on a week's vacation, and, and then after a couple of rigorous months like that, you go on another month's vacation. I, I believe you're off the entire month of August, and now you're on another taxpayer-funded uh, two-month vacation. Um, in some respects, when, when, you know, the Congress Congress has to go to work five days a week like everybody else uh, in America. And when you do that, you start getting to know one another, you develop respect for one another, you uh, learn where there are areas of compromise that are potentially uh, possible, and uh, you roll up your sleeves, you go to work, and you get things done. And I think we need to go back to that. Congressman Kravac, your thoughts on part well, of Well, I find it a little ironic that the Congressman is saying what our work schedule is and saying it in such a manner where our work schedule is published on, on uh, the website and where we, uh, the amount of time that we work, uh, what you call vacation, I call constituent work week, uh, coming back into district and doing over three, you know, going out to the districts, doing 20, uh, 29 town halls, 17 tele-town halls in district meeting, having four mayor roundtables where we were able to meet with over, uh, inviting over 200 mayors. We've had two job fairs uh, in, in the district. I call those constituent work weeks. And it's ironic that you mention it because in, in articles that you have said and statements you have made, you said that you, when you were in Congress, you work two days a week and you spend the rest of the days fundraising. Uh, that's what you said. While you were in Congress as well, uh, four, out of, four out of the six years in Congress, you voted yourself a pay raise. You increased your pay by 50 percent, and at the same time, you uh, missed 30 percent of your votes and, and, and while giving yourself a pay raise. So I find that a little bit ironic that you're, you're criticizing our work schedule and the work that we've done and the 29 town halls, the 17 tele, 300 mobile offices and going, going out through the district. And in regards to the frustration of Congress, I feel it too. <laughs> I'm extremely frustrated in the aspect that when we create bipartisan legislation in the House, we've got 38 bills sitting on the Senate side waiting for Senator Reid to take them up. These are bipartisan bills that have passed the House, and yet Senator Reid refuses to bring them up for open and honest debate. Allow them to fail or succeed on their own merits, but please, Senator Reid, allow them for open and honest debate, one of which is Boiler Mac, which directly affects our paper mills. But one of the most... Uh, the things that concerned me the most as a commanding officer was unattended consequences to, uh, to orders. The unattended consequences is going to affect our hospitals, our schools, and our municipalities for that boiler mac. Please, Senator Reid, take these 38 bills up. Congressman Nolan, I suspect you'd like to say something in response. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, again, the, the record is what the record is. And uh, this Congress is the most unaccomplished uh, Congress in uh, 60 or 70 years, both in terms of legislation uh, passed and, uh, and in terms of, of time uh, worked and served. And the problem is everybody, so everybody's campaigning and nobody's governing. I, I applaud you, of course, for the work that you do in the district and, and getting to know your constituency. But there's a time also to... Uh, go to Washington and go to work and to get things done. And with regard to my, my, my record, you know, you can't, you can't cherry pick a little period in time and characterize that as my voting record. Um, I, I served in elective office for 10 years and I was there well over 90% of the time. And uh, we cast a heck of a lot more votes than, than your Congress is casting. And it's a little easier when you have all your votes scheduled for six o'clock on Tuesday night. Um, you know, we, we had them scattered out over a much longer period of time. And you know as well as I do 
that most of those votes are of no consequence whatsoever. It's a, a, a vote on the reading of the minutes. It, somebody asks what time it is, and somebody else, uh, you know, calls for a recorded vote on it. So uh, I was there uh, for all the critical votes uh, during the time that I serve. And uh, uh, but there were times when they were having a vote on the, you know, the reading of the minutes, and I was in my office meeting with constituents, and and I and I don't mind telling you, I skipped some of those votes, and and I don't apologize for that. We were working with our constituents. We were getting things done. We had this country moving. We had uh, full employment, and uh, we had uh, a balanced budget, and uh, we weren't uh, throwing the towel in and going home when we found ourselves in disagreement with the loyal opposition. We stayed there, and we worked, and we duked it out until we got it done, and that's what we need to do again. Again, Congressman, you missed 30 percent of your votes the year before that. No, 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 I didn't, Chip. Stop saying that. I did. You're it's, picking out a little period in time, not, not, not the 10 years that I served, and that's not fair. You all, know that. All due respect, Congressman, the year prior to that, you missed 20 percent of your votes, and you voted four times, four years out of six to give yourself a 50 percent pay raise. Now, the Congressman is half right when he says we have a dysfunctional Congress in the aspect that we have a functional House it's just we need our senators to be prodded along a little bit to make sure that they get some of that legislation through. So the Congress consists of the House and the Senate. We've done our, our job in the, in the House. Now it's time for the Senate to do theirs. Well, and you know, you keep going back 30, 40 years ago. My God. You know, the, the congressional salary at the time was uh, uh, $40,000. Um, I had a young family, four children, uh, maintaining a home back here in my district with my family where we live and maintaining a home in Washington so I could be close to my family as well. We were working hard. Uh, we were doing a good job. Quite frankly, uh, you couldn't afford to stay in the Congress at, at that salary at that time, meaning two, maintaining two homes. So for me, it was a matter of uh, raising the salary to a level where uh, I could afford to stay in my Congress. And I was proud of the work I was, being, uh, was doing. And, and I remind you, you know, syndicated columnists uh, indicated that I was one of the 19 most respected members of the entire Congress, House and Senate. And they cited integrity, they cited someone who do the right thing, not the political thing, and they uh, cited someone who was effective, someone who got things done. So I'm very, very proud of my record of service. Congressman, you voted, your, like I said, you voted yourself 50% pay raise, which would equate to dollars today of $225,000. That's quite a home that you own in Washington, D.C. Okay, let's keep an eye on the clock now because we're coming close to uh, our final remarks and we are being broadcast, so we're mindful of the schedule there. Um, let's move to closing remarks. Uh, Tina, why don't you give each candidate four minutes this time and that'll bring us right up to the nine o'clock hour. And uh, Chuck, who is it that we decided would uh, go first? Representative Nolan will go first. Your closing remarks, Representative Noel. And no rebuts on closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you to the Tribune. Thank you to the Chamber. Uh, thank, you to, thank you to Chip. It's, it's been fun to have a chance to debate with you here. And uh, I have nothing but respect for Congressman Kravak's service. Uh, we just have a strong disagreement as to the direction that this country has to, to go in. In, in moving forward. Um, as I said in, in, in the beginning, Congressman Kravak has, has voted uh, to do away with Medicare. As we know it, uh, call it a voucher system, uh, call it uh, whatever. Uh, but it does away with Medicare. And in my judgment, that's a, a sacred promise that has been made to seniors. It's not an entitlement. It's an earned benefit that they're entitled to and have every right to expect and, quite frankly, are counting on. And the same can be said uh, of Social Security. Uh, that's not an entitlement. That's an earned benefit. And uh, uh, I will do everything in my power to stand up and protect them. And, and uh, I have a plan. And it's a plan to keep them as they are and to in no way uh, cut the benefits from that. My plan does not call for doing away with either one of them. I'm not going to turn uh, Medicare back over to the insurance companies, and I'm not going to uh, turn uh, Social Security over to Wall Street. Uh, that would be tragic. But as to, um, you know, the, the fundamental difference between us, you know, it, it's, all about, it's all about priorities. You've just repeatedly uh, voted to... Um, 
provide more and more tax breaks for the rich and, and the powerful while the middle class in this country is just getting crushed. You've repeatedly voted to spend more money on military adventures uh, abroad and nation building abroad while cutting funding for uh, domestic development here for our roads, for our bridges, our schools, our hospitals, uh, Pell grant, Grants for kids to, to, to go to college, uh, cutting funding uh, for education. And I just think uh, and firmly believe that uh, we need uh, a new set of priorities where we place America first and stop this nation building abroad where it's not wanted and it's not welcome and is not uh, doing us uh, any good in this country. So uh, that, that, that's the difference, and uh, I think it's dramatic, and I think it's uh, substantial. I think we offer uh, the voters here in the 8th District a, a pretty doggone clear choice, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing this debate with you and the other forums that we have planned. Um, you're a gentleman, and uh, it's been nice, it's been civil, and I look forward to the rest of this campaign campaigning with you. Thank you. Right, please. Well, thank you, Congressman Nolan, for being here today. I'd like to thank all of you for sharing your morning with us as well. It's been a privilege and an honor to represent the people of the 8th District. Over the past two years, we have created bipartisan, pro-growth, pro-job legislation that speaks for itself. The Buy American Steel Amendment, like I said, makes sure American steel goes in American projects. We've been able to pass an FAA bill after 26 or 23 extensions. We were able to pass a transportation bill after nine extensions. And we were able to pass a TSA bill that makes sure that our returning warriors are treated with the dignity, honor, and respect that they deserve when they're passing through our nation's airports. Right now, we have two very different courses that America is planning to take. One course is a course with solvency prosperity and opportunity for our children and the next generation of Americans. The other is more debt, more deficit, more decline. I know these times are tough, but I truly believe Americans are tougher. We've been in tougher scrapes than this. And I believe choosing the right course that America's best days lie ahead of them. I believe in limiting the size and scope of the federal government, thereby maximizing the individual freedom and liberty of the American people. I trust the American public more than I trust the American government and our future. I believe in a pro-growth tax reform. I don't believe in raising taxes in a recessionary time period, just as the president has said, as being a job creator. I believe in reducing the burdens of our small businesses, so they can expand and create the badly needed jobs that we need in our small towns. In stark contrast, my opponent believes in a little bit of an antiquated style of government. He believes in bigger government, more spending, more taxes, increased deficits, and increased debts. In fact, like I said earlier, Congressman Nolan has come out and said that he believes that EPA regulations create jobs. Well. If you ask our mining community, they would probably differ with that. Let's keep moving forward, not backwards. I hope that I've been able to meet your expectations in providing unparalleled access and top-notch constituent services throughout the 8th District. It has been a great privilege to do so. While much work needs to re remains to get people back to work and get our economy back on track, I humbly ask for your support and your vote so that I may report for duty in January and be a full up round to serve the great people of the 8th District. Thank you again for the Duluth News Tribune. Chuck, you've been great as moderator. Roger, I appreciate the Chamber for being here and all the Chamber does for our great community. And most of all, thank all of you for sharing your morning with us today. Well, thank, thank you both. Thank you very much.